All right, let's do a let's do a a, a, a a transition, if we may. Is George Walker not writing something akin to that work? It's let loose. It's large. It's rhetorical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not played safe. Uh, it's larger than life. Its characters are broadly and wildly created. Is that not the same style? It certainly is of, of that ilk, yes. And I think that's in time going to be seen as a period piece that will have to be studied in another 7,500 years. And that style will have to be re-exhumed and studied and learned because people at that time will be light years away from it, I'm but sure. Also talking about what actors want to do. They want to let loose, they want to get yeah. their teeth into it, yeah. chew the scenery, maybe a bit too much, but uh, and then this is Wonderland, again, yeah. a series that George absolutely, wrote yes. for television. Yes, absolutely. On television, yeah. there was a style of acting yes, that there was. offended some people, but was exciting to a whole lot more people. Exactly. Of a full-bodied, yeah. large, rhetorical yes. sense So let's of, not make the mistake of contaminating this with naturalism. It's not. <laughs> Uh, and let's not pretend that it is. Oh, oh, they're doing bad naturalism. They weren't. So let's go for, let, let's go more into it. Let's, let's be, be even bigger, even more outrageous. So have you ever thought of, of doing, uh, say, a 19th century play and then doing a George Walker play side by side and watching the reflexes of the, the actors have to use for either? That would be quite interesting. I mean, that's why I find George's work so refreshing. Yeah. Because it's, it's yes, out, yes, you know? Yes, absolutely. It's not careful. Yeah. It's committed. Yes, exactly. And that's precisely what, what, what the period study teaches these kids. Um, so, uh, you know, and we, then we, go, we come up into, into uh, Henry Arthur Jones and the Silver King. There is a magnificent melodrama. Now, they did that at the Shaw Festival some years ago, and they didn't do it well because they pulled their punches, they were afraid of it, they didn't trust it. They didn't trust the big, the big emotions, and so they filled the stage with stuff and made a, a, a big confusing production number. They didn't go with those terrific outside, em, outsized emotions, gray, big, long areas. Uh, you, you just have to commit whole, Heartedly to them. I learned that when I was a kid. I was 10 years old when I was first taken to see my father, who was a singer. Both my parents were musicians. Uh, he was a singer, he was a, a baritone. Um, sang professionally and had a very good career, but it was the 30s, it was the, it was the depression, and he wasn't about to trust that because he had a young family. So he was also the assistant manager of the electrical department of the Timothy Eaton Memorial, Timothy Eaton Company. So we have the diamond E right here in our foreheads. <laughs> um, but this, was an annual presentation, production, <coughs> of, an, of Gilbert and Sullivan Opera, done by the Eaton Operatic Society. In that magnificent Eaton Auditorium that was up on top of the Eaton's College Street store. <coughs> Wonderful old... Still is. Art, yes, yes, our noble um, and they did a Gilbert and Sullivan opera there every year. My father sang the baritone leads, and I began to be taken to see those things from the age of about 10. The first one I remember seeing was the Mikado, in which he played Puba. And then there was the Pirate King, and uh, um, the Yeoman of the Guard, in which he was... Wilfred Shadbolt, head jailer and assistant tormentor, and Radigore or the Witch's Curse, which he played the despised Murgatroyd. All of those things 
were my real introduction to, to theater, the magic and the power of theater. First experience I'd really ever had. And I was transfixed by the, the, the story, the intensity of the emotions, the sudden interruptions. Stay, hold your hand. It just, I understood something from that. And only later <clears throat> did I understand what it was that I understood. And that was the power of melodrama. The power of great melodrama done with full hearted commitment. There is nothing like it in the theater, and that is what I convey to these kids. Is there any contemporary example, do you think, that has some of that power? Apart from uh, evangelical uh, <laughs> Christian uh, sermons which has that kind of melodramatic rhetorical power. Yes, knowledge. yes, it does. I'm just trying to think of something that might, might have something like that. I'm sure there must be, but I can't call it anything to mind at the moment. Because it is a taste. As there are different yeah. tastes in yeah. music, there are yes, different yes, tastes yes, in absolutely. literature. You're and talking about a dramatic taste yeah, for yes. uh, the power of melodrama, yes, a form yes. which is not respected much because there was such a reaction against it and, with and naturalism, yes. with the studio, with actor studio, with yes, Chekhov, yes, with of Stanislavski. Course, of course, of course. But I I again, we have, I to paraphrase you, we've mm -hmm. lost the gold of that time we have, yes. by disrespecting its, mm -hmm. its degraded form. And, yeah, de degraded form, yes, and then making fun of it. And making fun of it. Yeah. We've lost sight of the gold that actually yes. was at the center of it. But, oh, there is nothing more gripping. And when I can see those kids doing it and see them catching that germ, that stays with them for, for life. And uh, yes, the bells, the bells, the, uh, the silver king, and Arthur Wing Pinero, just uh, something like the second Mrs. Tanqueray. Oh, the power of those big scenes.